I have a video that I'd like you to pay attention to, and you'll see some people with a ball. And I want you to pay attention and count the number of times they pass the ball to each other. This is very important when you really focus on the number of times they pass the ball to each other. And you're going to see these same instructions in writing again. So, uh, Matt, if you could play that video, I would greatly appreciate that. Now count the number of times they pass the ball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? All right. This right. video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Shabri. Thank you. How many people saw the gorilla the first time? No, most of you didn't see it. I did not see it the first time. Because I've told you to focus on something in particular. So you just didn't even see the gorilla that was right in your face. And what? ADHD. Now, chances are, if you're ADHD, you might have seen the gorilla. Okay? So. They call it a deficit, but I tell you, it's a benefit. <laughs> Your pastor's got it, let me tell you. <laughs> it's a blessing. Woo. All right. Now, you may say, well, why did I just show you that video? There's a text that tells us kind of the difference between us and God. It's in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, 7, it says, um, in 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel is looking for a king. And um, he, he sees all these handsome, tall men that he wants to pick. And God don't want any of them. And so he says, so the Lord says to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We have focus issues. We are so focused on certain external things, we miss the obvious. And we have been taught to do this. We have been taught to look at how somebody dresses, to look at somebody's complexion, to look at their height, and to determine, and look at their teeth even, to determine if they are someone we can trust. Are they a safe person? Or are they dangerous? And we're so busy looking at these external physical things, we completely miss the most obvious, which is why God is constantly telling us the same thing over and over again. Because in this world, we don't live in the kingdom of God. Okay? The prince of the air, the adversary, that's the kingdom we have. Okay? Adam and Eve gave it away, and so now he's claiming rulership. And he tells us to focus on the things that matter the least. So the least important things we're focusing on. Okay? When somebody, you know, and, and we all know this. Because we have titles for it now. We call it racism, sexism, bigotry. That's what we call it. You could call it peer pressure. But these are all things that we focus on. They're all external. You know, I, I think the Bible's interesting because they don't actually have racism the way we understand it. They, they don't look, look at people towards their coloring and complexion. But they looked at people based on the, where they were from, their language. 
okay, and their 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 culture, okay. So you could be a Roman, and you could be dark, or you could be light, but you were a Roman. Okay. Now we are even more twisted than they are, because you can be an American, but you're not quite an American because we got to hyphenate it. You got to be a white American, a Filipino American, a Black American, an African American American. A, a Hispanic American, a Mexican American. Let me just tell you something real quick. Your pastor, who, a Native American? Oh, a Native American. You, like, what is that? <laughs> oh, and now, oh, the new word is indigenous American. Like, I'm like, are you kidding me? I just want you to know. So, your pastor, I am technically in the socially constructed construct we call race a black American. But I want to tell you, my closest ancestor, the one that's closest, and then there's a couple. One's a Mexican, okay, let's just be clear. From Texas, because Texas is part of Mexico. <laughs> and then on the other side, the other one's a Portuguese dude, right? Who illegally immigrated, okay? And Super funny, right? And then I got some an indigenous American. The person farthest away is the African. Like 10 generations. Oh, I forgot. Closer than the African is the Indian. Not indigenous American, but the India Indian. Okay, let's just be clear. Let's, let's, this is why race is ridiculous. Completely. And it was created by a bunch of dudes who were racist, who were intentionally planning on separating people based on color, which is like crazy. Like, so Egypt is part of Africa, right? Mm -hmm. But have you ever noticed in the news, they never call it Africa? They never say, oh, those Africans in Egypt? Did you ever like think about that? This is ludicrous. And the Middle East. The Middle East is like connected to Africa, and, and India is part of Asia, and then there's Europe, and then like what about the people in like, uh, I'm forgetting, Uzbekistan? What do they count as? Right? Like, how, how does this work? And Finnish people. Have any of you ever know any Finns? They're, Euro tech, they're Europeans. They look like white Asians. They have slanted eyes. Their features, they have the certain cheekbones, but they're blonde haired and blue eyed. Guess what? A whole bunch of Asians went over there. But you never hear anybody talk about it. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're Finnish and the person's actually from Finland, then they tell you about it and they're all excited about it. <laughs> okay? It's very interesting. But we look at these external physical things and decide who the person is. And I, 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 I'm laughing about this, but sometimes it's not nice. We experience this in our church. Now, we expect to experience it outside in the world. It's wrong. We have laws against it now. But it still happens. But we experience it sometimes in more subtle ways. <coughs> and it's somewhat, it's natural because we're sinners. That doesn't mean it's good. And everything we get from this group that we were born in doesn't make it right. And we learn bad things from our groups that we were born in. And Jesus comes into our lives and brings it to our attention because he wants to take that bad part out and put in good. Okay? Now, there's, I've got a bunch of texts, but This is something that we struggle with even here at Wellsprings, which is super crazy. You have a black pastor who is <laughs> female. There's, there's no question about that one. I didn't change, I didn't switch. I've always been female according to my mother and I intend to stay that way. Niall, you may not be, that's your decision. I just want just to be clear on that one. That is the one biological construct that will not change in my life about me. Now, all the other stuff, my hair color. Next week, my hair color could be blonde. My eyes could be blue. 
They could be. But those things are not actually important. Okay? But we have this struggle, even here, where we have a predominantly, our culture of a church is predominantly Filipino. But we have people from Mexico who go to church here, okay, who were born in Mexico and have immigrated to the United States. We have people who were born outside of America who speak Mandarin. Um, we've got a lot going on here. And most of the time, we're really good. But sometimes we're not. Because we're used to doing things in a certain way in our certain groups. And we don't realize that we exclude others. And if you don't realize that you're doing something, you're not going to stop. It's uncomfortable and it's awkward. It's as awkward as somebody telling you to count the passes of the people wearing black and of the people wearing white when there's people wearing black and me not telling you that there's a gorilla in the room. That's not fair. You should be able to see everything that's happening so you can make a choice to do something different. Now, sometimes we just don't think about the people outside of our group. That is racism. We don't know it. We just don't even consider them. You didn't even consider that there might be a gorilla. It didn't even come into, why would there be a gorilla? We have to be intentional about thinking about other people. It will not happen naturally. We must make ourselves uncomfortable and invite the person that makes us feel awkward sometimes. This is a common problem in the church. Any church, not just an Adventist church, any church. If you look at Acts, they had this problem. Lest you think I'm making it up. And you may wonder, well, if it's normal, what, it could just go on until Jesus comes. No, it does not need to go on until Jesus comes. That's nonsense. And it doesn't need to go on until Jesus comes in God's church. As a matter of fact, I challenge you, if you have racist behaviors, you are endangering your salvation because that's a part of your life you have not turned over to Jesus Christ yet. Because he would not leave you in the dark. If you turn to Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now, this is Jesus has come, gone, resurrected. They done got the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews, Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. You're like, okay, who cares? No. What the text is saying to you is those Jews who consider themselves true Jews, we're not taking care of them other Jews they didn't consider to be really Jews. Okay? You could even call it the conservatives versus the liberals. The conservatives were like, well, they're not really Jews. That's why they called them the Hellenists versus the Hebrews. The Hellenists were Greekified. Okay? They had bought into some Greek the theology and concepts. And so the Hebrews, the Jews, as they thought of themselves, were like, well, we're just, they just didn't even pay that much attention to them. So they were, notice the word, neglected. Not purposely ignored, just neglected. They didn't think about them. And then it says, the 12 were summoned. And they said, and then they, we're not talking about what they said, but then it says in verse 4, they are want to give themselves, con oh no, verse 3, I'm sorry, 6 verse 3. It says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. This was a serious issue. They called a council over the mistreatment of the widows. 
because they were being ignored. And then it says, now look at verse 5, and people miss this, and it says, And the saying pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Every one of those names is a Hellenistic name. Not one of those names is a Hebrew name. This is really important. When the minority, whatever minority group you happen to have in your group is suffering neglect, the best way to deal with it is to put some of them in charge. And they were so full of the Holy Spirit, they picked all, all the ones they picked were from the minority. I thought about this. I said, why would they do this? Aren't they afraid that the minority is going to get revenge on the majority and then start neglecting the majority? You might be afraid of that, but no. Because they're Christians. They were full of the Holy Spirit. So they would remember what it was like to be neglected. And they would be intentional about ministering to everyone. Extra careful to reach anyone who was involved and needed help. This is what we need to do. We have to be intentional about being inclusive. It's not about quotas. It's, that's ridiculousness. That's the devil's substitution. But when you're intentional to say, I notice that all of the leadership look like this, that's probably not normal. Let me start asking people who look different to find out what's going on with them and bring them into my inner circle and into my house and into my world. Invite them to the weddings. Invite them to the funerals. Invite them to the dinners. Invite them, invite them, and bring them into my life as my brother or sister. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. And you might say, you know, Tammy, we are supposed to be talking about Daniel. What does this have to do with the kingdom of God coming? It has everything to do with the kingdom of God coming. Before Jesus comes in the clouds, he's got to come in your heart. Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is within us. Okay? And once the kingdom of God is within us, that's the only way we're going to be able to enjoy the kingdom of God that's outside when it gets here. You can't have the devil in you and then think you're going to be in heaven. No, you won't want that. You know, this is a terrible saying, but they said you can, you can take a person out of sin, but you can't take the sin out of the person. God can take the sin out and take them out of the place of sin. He can do both. But we have to let him. Now, Let's look at Daniel. You might think that I'm just dealing with this because this is a current, this is just what we deal with today, but that is not true. We miss this very obvious thing in the book of Daniel. And it's all over the place. If you start off in, I gotta get there. We were, we've been in Daniel chapter two for the last couple of weeks. And we see that in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a stream, and Daniel's the only one who can interpret it. But if you look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 25, Daniel has told the captain of the guard, Arioch, that he can interpret the dream. God has given it to him. And so Arioch quickly brings Daniel before the king, Daniel chapter 2, verse 25, and says to him, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now, what does the fact that Daniel is a captive of Judah have to do with anything? Absolutely nothing. Daniel is a wise man. In fact, he's ten times wiser than everybody else. We know that because that's the end of chapter 1. But this guy doesn't see Daniel as being his equal. He points out to Daniel's history of being a slave and his nationality of being from Judah, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Then you see that and you think, oh, Pastor Tim, you're just making that up. You're throwing the race card up in there. No, I'm not. It's already there. 
I look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 12. This is the three Hebrew boys. They're young men. They're men at this point, by the way. They're not children anymore. And, and Nebuchadnezzar set up the statue. He wants everybody to bow down to this ridiculous statue in the middle of a plane. And he's got his whole orchestra band and their cacophony of noise, which is chaotic noise. And every time they hear the noise, they're supposed to bow down to this ridiculous statue in the middle of a plane. And they don't do it. There's, there's only three of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And they don't do it. And it says in verse 12 of chapter 3, There are certain Jews whom you set over the affair of the province of Babylon. What is them being Jews got to do with anything? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, they have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. The point is they don't serve your God. The fact of them being Jews ought to be somewhat irrelevant. But it's not. It's in there intentionally. Then if you look at chapter 5, verse 13, and it says, Daniel comes in to talk to Belshazzar. So Nebuchadnezzar has died. His son's been on the throne. Now his grandson's on the throne. So we got a whole bunch of time that's passed, and Daniel's still dealing with this mess. And Daniel's brought in before the king. This is chapter 5, verse 13. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you the Daniel who was one of the captives of Judah? Like, seriously? He's been a wise man all of Belshazzar's life. And this is what he's focused on. This is ridiculous. And it continues. We go into chapter 6, verse 13. Now, Darius, we got a brand new kingdom. And, it, and if you look at chapter 6, verse 13, now these guys, I'm not getting into the whole story, but Daniel's been set up because they don't like him. And this is part of the reason you know. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you. H haven't we heard this before? Now, Daniel's been a wise man. Man, he's old. By the way, Daniel's not a young man. Okay? He's, he's got to be pushing 50, 60 at this point. And they're still identifying him as the captive from Judah. Who, by the way, he has more power than the people who are talking about him. But they point to something he cannot change. Something external. We face prejudice in this world. If you've ever been a minority in a group of people where you were just you. If you were the only white person, if you were the only black person, if you were the only brown person, if you were the only Asian person, you were going to deal with this. And it seems like if you're a Christian, it's like a double burden sometimes. You get picked on twice. And, and it's a struggle. And, and you might wonder, how long do I have to deal with this? Well, if you look at chapter 7, verse 25. You're going to find out. It's talking about um, a little horn. I'm not going to get into who the little horn is, but we find out that he speaks pompous words against the Most High, and he will persecute the saints of the Most High. You will be persecuted, not only because of your beliefs, but they will persecute you because you look the way you look, because you belong to the people you belong to. They will blame you if you're white, for all, every evil thing that has ever been done to every other non-white group on, in the universe. And you were not there. If you were black, they will blame you for every crime that is ever committed. And when you're driving down the street, they will stop you because you happen to be black and driving. If you are Asian and you happen to get a B, they will look at you like you are the lowest Asian on the planet because you were not number one in your class. Okay? No, seriously. It, and it, this is something that was very interesting to me. They want you to be smart, but they don't want you to be the boss if you're Asian. You know? It's crazy. But it's all 
because of what you look like. And then don't be a Christian because they'll be like, oh, no, you might make me be Christian and you're Asian. Whoa, no, no, no. But it's just an excuse to not give you the place that God intends for you to hold. It's to tear you down and to wear you out so that you will give up on the kingdom of God that is coming and that you will have bitterness and anger and you will not have the kingdom of God in your heart because you will be so hurt. You will feel like the life is so unfair and it's, you've been so wronged that instead you will become hateful and mean and become like the adversary. And then you will lose out on the kingdom of God. You will lose your sense of peace. And this is why God gives us the gift of prophecy. This is why we're studying Daniel. So that you will know that, yes, you will suffer. God's not going to have a gorilla in the room and you not know about it. You will suffer, but you will not suffer forever, and he will be with you in your suffering. That's the point of the story of the Hebrew boys. Most of you have heard the story, so I actually didn't spend a lot of time on it. But when you find out that God puts you in a place or allows you to be put in a place where you will suffer, where you will be thrown into the fire, you are going to have to stand up for yourself, for the God that's in you, the God that's outside of you, your belief system. And you will have to answer to the enemy and say, I'm not going to be careful how I answer you. But my God, the God I believe in, tells me not to do that. You do whatever you want to do. And it's okay. I'll go buy it onto the statue if you want to. But I will not. I'm not mad at you. I'm not hating on you. I'm not even being mean to you. I'm just not going to do it. And they will take you and call you the racist. They will call you intolerant. They will say that you are the one who is wrong. And they will fire you, try to fire you, just try to make your life miserable, throw you into the furnace. This is a big power trip. They will throw you in the furnace that they created and then say, let's see what your God will do for you. And you don't know what God's going to do. And this is what the Hebrew boys say. They say, our God has the power to save us. But even if he doesn't save us, we will not bow down. God may not save you from being misrepresented. He may not save you from suffering racism. He may not save you from not getting that job. He may not. But not because he doesn't have the power to do it. He just may not do it. But he may put you in that situation, have you tossed around and thrown around, feel like you've been worn out and trampled upon and crushed. He may, you, he may allow you to feel that way. And guess what? You may look over and be like, God, why are you letting me feel like this? And he may say, a till a time and a half a times. But he'll speak to you. And he'll be with you. And he'll be like, I know. See, Daniel didn't know he was told about the cross, but we know about the cross. And he will say, but I've overcome the world for you. I've got the Holy Spirit. He will give it to you when you are in your furnace of affliction. And you can walk in the fire, and they will wonder, why I'm pushing her. I'm torturing her. I'm torturing him. I'm abusing him. And he comes into work every day. And he does the best job he can do, and a better job ten times than everybody else. And we don't pay him the same amount. We don't pay her as much as we pay the men. She does more work, and she, she's got a peace about her. Where does she get that from? And the next thing you know, you hear your boss calling you, um, I think I need to give you a promotion. <laughs> and suddenly you're out of the fire, and not only are you out of the fire, you are in charge of the people who put you in the fire. <laughs> and 
you, and this is not what you expected. You thought you were going to die. Whoa. Now understand, God will only allow you to suffer if it will bring someone else to God who would never have come to God but for your suffering. He will not let you suffer for nothing. He will only let you suffer when he knows that he's provided a way of escape or he has made sure he's given you enough of himself that you are strong enough to bear it. He will not let you suffer for nothing. You've got to know that. You may not know what it is at the moment. I, I had a pastor when I was going through some of the worst suffering of my life, and, and I love him because he was a, uh, a lay pastor. He was just an old, wise man full of the Holy Ghost. And, and I, I was just going through stuff, and he says, Tammy, this is your stepping stone to greatness. And if I had not gone through that, I wouldn't be here. I praise the Lord that I'm here. Daniel would never have been in charge, the second in command, through kingdom after kingdom. His friends would never have been in charge from kingdom after kingdom if they hadn't been thrown into the fire, for a fiery furnace and stood strong for God. If Daniel hadn't been thrown into the lion's den and stayed all night with a bunch of lions. I don't know, any of y'all ever like actually physically touched a lion? Who's touched a lion in here? Have you ever had one jump on you? I had a lion jump on me. This is amazing. And, and I really almost wet myself. It was like the scariest experience of my life because their teeth are this big. And they're big! And by the way, this one was still a juvenile. It was still young. It was only like a year and a half. And I was like, oh! <laughs> and it was just when the teeth get in your face and then it licks you, you don't know that it's going to lick you. It's very scary. And I, it was amazing because then you get over it. And it's awesome because you looked into the mouth of a lion and you lived. Right? <laughs> Although they tell you, don't get down on the ground because it might forget that you are a person and it might try to eat you. Oh. <laughs> so you always have to stay uh, standing up. You can't ever fall because they might forget. But it was a cool experience. A lion and the Enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. But in the strength of the Lord, it says, stand strong. Lift up the banner. Sometimes you can't, you can't outrun a lion, but you can stand there. And you can say, I will not be careful about this. My God has the power to save me. Amen. This is the world. That's when the kingdom of God is in your heart and you're in the furnace and it doesn't hurt you. It says they didn't even have the smell of smoke. By analogy, you could think when you go through pain and suffering, you won't even have the taste of bitterness in your character when you go through these things. You will have the love, the sweet love of God will be your character. There's something God says to Daniel after he's gone through some of his afflictions and he's been taken into captivity and all this. Daniel starts praying because he wants to know how long the suffering will continue. And he looks at prophecy and he realizes it's going to be 70 years. And in Daniel chapter 9, he begins to pray. And he fasts because he doesn't look like the Lord is doing anything. And they're still suffering. And God sends his messenger, and this is how the messenger greets Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. And at the beginning of your supplications, your requests, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, and you are greatly beloved. Your suffering has nothing to do with how much God loves you. You have to realize this. That you are greatly beloved. God would have died for you by yourself if you were the only sinner on this planet. God, you are greatly beloved, and Daniel is our example. If you can remember that, no matter what you suffer, whether it's racism in the church, 
whether it's sexism in the church. And there is. There's sometimes, and I'm going to go back to this because, you know, we have different standards for people. For one person, we would never pay attention. I'm going to pick on something. I'm going to be very direct. And we just had Father's Day. We have men in this church who are very calm. So they're, some of them aren't here. One is here today. And um, they, they aren't the type of guys that get up and start ordering people around. They don't get up and open the Bible and start quoting scripture and walk to the front of the church and say, okay, now we pray, now we do this, now we do that. That's not them. They have, and we think they are not servants of God. We'll be like, oh, well, I don't know if that's a spiritual head. Because we have in our mind a stereotype of a spiritual leader. Jesus defied that. And a spiritual leader is someone who serves, who gets down on the ground and washes feet, who does the things that nobody else wants to do. But guess what? A servant can also be that person who stands up and says, you know what? It's time to pray. We need to pray. And they're not always delicate and they're not always gentle. But we can accept that from a man. But get a woman up there and she gets very directive and we're like, oh, she's not that nice. <laughs> I don't know if she got the right character. And if she was a man, we'd just be like, oh, he's just like that, but he loves the Lord. And we have these double standards. We get nice men who are willing to serve and do all these things, and then we think, oh, well, they're not spiritually strong enough. And then we get a woman, and we're like, oh, well, she's not that nice. And you know what we end up? Not enough leaders. Because we are looking on the outside, looking for someone tall. Look, there was a leader who said that women shouldn't be ordained because, notice, men are taller than women. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I was like, did you not read 1 Samuel? Okay, like, there's a text on that. Dude, and his dude goes around preaching to people. Like, some of y'all got his tapes at home. He just tells you that, like, you got to be careful. You got to study. If you hear these sermons, you're like, oh, boy, he's wonderful. No, he's not. Go study what he's saying. He might be twisting some scriptures. Okay? Now, I, I mean, I bring that up because that's a perfect example of us looking outside and not looking on the heart. And when we do that, we are breaking the law of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. We must remember that in every decision that we make because the kingdom of God does not come by searching. It doesn't. It comes by accepting the love of God that God has for you, repenting of your sin, seeing that you are a sinner, that you are low, Amen. and that God will lift you up, Amen. and recognizing that person that you see as low, God will lift him or lift her up and lift them above your head because you see them as better than you. Amen. Paul could preach because he felt like he was the worst sinner. And he had done horrible things some of us will never do. We must look at other people as better than we are, as wiser, as smarter. We chase people away from God with our professions of godliness because we know the law and we walk in and we crush their little hearts. We do more damage because of our pride. And last week we talked about who the father of pride was. The, the father of the children of pride is the adversary. When you think you're better than somebody else, you better get down on your knees. That's why we pray on our knees. It keeps you humble. Now, we want the kingdom of God in our hearts. That means a servant's heart. That means I love you so much I'm going to get down on my knees for you to get you closer to God. I'm going to suffer some things because I love you. I'm not going to judge you. That's God's job. My job is to love you because the kingdom of God is about love and mercy and he, we leave the justice to him. 
Our job is to love and have mercy. And we've got all these agendas going on, chaos in our midst right now. Racism, sexism, bigotry, transgender, trans whatever you are. I'm telling you, this is all a distraction. Don't get on the bandwagon and talk about I need to fight for, for a marriage between man and a woman or man and man or whatever. You need to get on the bandwagon of we need to love people regardless of what they're doing, whether it's legal or illegal. No matter what the Supreme Court says, our job remains the same, to preach the gospel. Jesus loves you. He wants you in his kingdom. Don't you know? Amen. That's our job. Mm -hmm. You want to get politically active? Get out there and start telling people you are loved. There's a book of the Bible that doesn't mention God's name. Esther. You don't gotta, Esther, you don't got to mention God's name to love somebody. They'll come and ask you who your God is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when they're ready... They will come. You just go love them. That's how you get through the agendas. Amen. Struggle with the hard issue. How do I love the person who hates me because I'm colored? Whatever the color you are. How do I love that person? How do I get over my bitterness? How do I pray? How do I keep forgiving? Talk to God about those things. We need to have deep discussions on those things. Okay, we need to have general conference sessions on, I don't like so-and-so because he's horrible and I got to watch him preach on TV all the time. Okay, how do I get over this? That's what we need a GC session over. Like, seriously, we, those are the hard issues. And that's what we got to work on. And Daniel is a book about hard issues. And about prophecy that tells us, I, God says, struggle with the hard issues so I can talk to you and get you through. When you're suffering, I can get you through. And you will shine like the sun because let me tell you what he says in Daniel chapter 12. And it says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. So God will stand up. Okay? And this is in verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the kingdom that is talked about all the way back in Daniel chapter 2. This is the kingdom that's going to rise in your heart. This is the hand that cuts out a rock without, this, that cuts a rock without hand. This is, this is it that comes and destroys all the kingdoms and turns them to dust and sets up a kingdom. And in those days, these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these wicked, evil Babylons, Rome, the United States when it's doing evil, China, Russia, all these places, will, all these kingdoms will be destroyed and consumed. But this kingdom of God where righteousness and justice and mercy have kissed, will consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Your suffering is not in vain, because you're going to be in that kingdom. You're going to choose God because he's a good, loving God. And you want to shine like the brightness of the firmament. And when he comes in the clouds, this is as deep as answers to deep. The Holy Spirit that's in you is going to see the God that's in the sky. And the kingdom of heaven in your heart is going to see the kingdom of heaven coming down. And you're going to meet. That's where I want to be. Do you want to be there? Let's be there. Let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, my God, gracious, gracious, long-suffering God, all power for the almighty, we come today because we want the kingdom of God in our hearts. Fill our hearts with your son of righteousness. Light up the dark places. We want to shine like the firmament. Oh, great God in heaven, Grant us thy Holy Spirit and fill it with us. Bless us this day as we go out from this place. Fill us so that we will never go out from your presence, Father. 
and those of our friends and loved ones who are part of your invisible church. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Touch them even now that they might have the power of the Holy Ghost to bring many to righteousness. In your name, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And Lord God, as we partake of the fellowship meal that we are going to eat, let us give you praise with every mouthful. Let us give you honor and glory because you have provided for us physical and spiritual things. In your name, amen. Amen. amen.